Good afternoon. I hope you had a pleasant lunch. My name is Marcus Nolan. It is my distinct honor to moderate this panel on Asian security. Uh, the first day, I heard Mr. Rabinowitz describe going to a church and hearing the preacher preach about a passage in the book of Matthew in which Jesus says the last will be first and the first shall be last. Well, we're nearly the last, um, but I think maybe if we're not the most important, we're nearly the most important panel. Um, we have two speakers who have very tight airplane connections, so I'm going to skip reading the bios, because once I started reading them, I realized that all of our speakers are, pres are prestigious former government officials or hold prestigious academic positions, and you can read the details. What I thought we would do is start in Northeast Asia, because that's where the uh, North Korean issue is most acute. We'll start with uh, Mr. Yim from South Korea, followed by uh, Mr. Uh, Hosoya from um, uh, uh, Japan, uh, uh, Mr. Jia from China. Then we'll move to Southeast Asia with Mr. Yao, uh, followed by Yusuf Wanandi, and then Mr. Uh, Narayan from uh, India. Mr. Narayan seemed a little displeased about going last, but I had to remind him that according to Jesus, he's got the most prestigious position on the panel. So without any further ado, please, uh, in, in light of our limited time, please try to keep it to roughly eight minutes. Mr. Yim, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Marcus, I mean, for the privilege uh, to speak first. I mean, well, I'm, the, uh, suppo I'm supposed to be the last speaker in my alphabetical order. Well, it is always uh, nice and lovely to visit Marrakesh, Marrakesh. Uh, but I think it's a pity and a regret that I have to talk about the most serious and grave problem, security problem in the world now. Well, um, uh, this issue is not new, uh, as uh, you all know, has been uh, for 25 years uh, for the attention of the security people uh, of uh, most, uh, uh, you know, uh, concerned countries. Well, I was uh, heavily involved when uh, this issue came out uh, maybe in early 1990s. Well, uh, I see some participants, I mean, uh, well, uh, work together, I mean, to uh, resolve the issue. Well, uh, these days, I mean, uh, tension uh, has been built uh, very heavy uh, in my country, uh, not because uh, we expect any a possible provocation by North Korea again, but because of the arrival of President Trump. Well, uh, Korean government, I mean, mounted maximum security vigilance, I mean, uh, you know, in protection of the U.S. president. Uh, well, as I told you, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, this nuclear issue of North Korea has been there for the last 20 years. So I think uh, if I uh, try to go through all the phases of this issue, it will take, uh, you know, maybe hours or so. Uh, I will skip the uh, early part of uh, this issue, but I will just uh, start from uh, the recent development of uh, this North Korean nuclear quagmire. Well, uh, global outrage at North Korea's nuclear program has grown since September this year when Pyongyang claimed a successful test of a hydrogen bomb and made further threats to detonate another hydrogen bomb in the West Pacific Ocean. Unprecedented exchanges of personal attacks between the US president and North Korean leader marked another escalation in the war of wars. Mr. Trump calling him rocket man told the UN that he would totally destroy the North if uh, threatened. While Kim Jong-un called Trump a mentally deranged U.S. daughter. Well, I had to find the, the word daughter in the dictionary. I didn't know what it really meant. I think that we now 
have to squarely ask the question, why did the international efforts fail to prevent North Korea from developing a weapons of mass destruction program? What went wrong for the last almost 20 years? My answer is follows. Number one, North Korea has invariably been cheating and it vanished on the agreements it signed where it promised to freeze and stop its nuclear program in return for a security guarantee and economic benefits. Thus, North Korea is squarely to blame and should be held responsible. North Korea experiencing devastation of the country by the massive bombing of the US during the Korean War and being isolated at the end of the Cold War, North Korea set a national goal to develop a nuclear weapons program which could guarantee its regime's survival under any circumstances. That was also the supreme and standing order from Kim Il-sung, North Korea's founder, and later uh, uh, this order was enshrined in their constitution. Then why did North Korea come to the negotiation table and close those past deals to denuclearize? North Korea made three agreements, but uh, three agreements were not implemented at all. The answer is simple. North, Korean, North Korea needed both the weaponization of nuclear and missile capabilities and certain benefits from outside, a security guarantee, economic assistance, and diplomatic normalization with the Western countries. North Korea believed that it could achieve both objectives at the same time, continuing the WMD program while negotiating for the necessary benefits. Now North Korea officially pursues nuclear and economic development together, and they declared it as in Korean Byongjin Jongchek or two-track policy. Secondly, the US, Japan, and South Korea, including myself, were deceived by the North Korean unprecedented scam. Later, former Clinton officials said that they knew North Korea was cheating on the HEU program and planned to use that intelligence as leverage to keep the agreed framework in place and the plutonium on the lock and key. Cheating is bad, but being cheated sometimes worse. Having learned of the past history, the Obama administration barely bothered to restart the disarmament talks with the North. Instead, it adopted a policy called strategic patience, doing nothing. But under that policy, they lost the time allowing North Korea to improve its mastery of nuclear and missile technology. On numerous occasions, including during his presidential campaign, Trump vowed that he was committed to resolving the North Korean nuclear issue. He's on an Asian uh, trip now. He will arrive in Seoul, I think, on, uh, in the morning of Tuesday. So we are looking at his lips. Despite Trump's tough talk, his choice of options may not be wide open due to restrictions that are inherent in each of them. Among the potential options that have been raised, I'd like to discuss a few of them and their ability to achieve the goal of CVID of the North Korean program. First, the military option. Donald Trump has said that any U.S. military option would be devastating for North Korea. But he added that military action isn't Washington's preferred option to deal with North Korea's ballistic and nuclear weapons program. Theoretically, if North Korea fired an ICBM targeting U.S. territory or South Korea or Japan, the U.S. would make a preemptive strike on North Korean military sites, and that could lead to North Korea's massive retaliatory attack 
on South Korea or even uh, Japan. This scenario of going to war with North Korea would risk the lives of millions of people across the region. Regardless of how much has been said about possible military action, in reality, this war scenario is the last option to take. President Moon of my country and China has openly opposed any war scenarios on the Korean Peninsula. South Korea's nuclear option. As North Korea is closer than ever to full-blown nuclear capability, and prospects for resolving this problem seem dim and prolonged. Public opinion in South Korea recently has moved toward favoring a scenario in which South Korea also should go nuclear. The conservative political community in Korea strongly insists that the best way to deal with North Korean nuclear provocation and threats is to arm South Korea with its own nuclear weapons, or redeploy US tactical nuclear weapons, which were pulled out in the early 1990s. Should South Korea take this option, it would also face unbearable difficulties and strong opposition from the international community, including the US, China, Japan, and others. Third, sanctions plus show of strength. That means extended deterrence by the US. Since North Korea con uh, conducted its first nuclear test in 2006, North Korea has been under economic and financial sanctions introduced by the UN Security Council and the international community. The Trump administration recently adopted an executive order to deny North Korea's access to the international banking system. These strengthened sanctions imposed on North Korea should be effective and are quite different from the past ones which failed to affect North Korea's already shattered economy. In order to thwart North Korea's continuing provocation, the US South Korea recently put on maximum military vigilance and conducted joint military drills with various US strategic resources being deployed on and around the Korean Peninsula, including three aircraft carrier strike groups. It, in fact, uh, since its last test of a hydrogen bomb and firing of an ILBM in September, North Korea has maintained the silence. My conclusion is that a nuclear armed North Korea is not acceptable. Number two, unless South Korea and the US is attacked, military options are out of consideration. Continuation of stringent sanctions on North Korea plus US extended deterrence and show of strength would be the best option to deter North Korean provocation, which I hope will lead to a CVID resolution of this <laughs> quagmire. Finally, should North Korea continue on this path, then the international community should be united to bring down the Kim Jong-un regime. I will stop here. Thank you very much for uh, setting the table. Mm -hmm. Professor Hosoya. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marka. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for, to be included in this session with so many excellent speakers. And I, when I first heard that I was included in this session to talk, I was so, so glad that I forgot that my flight departure here at the 6.25, so I have only three hours. So much more than usual, I have to uh, brief. Uh, in the beginning, I like to uh, talk about the possibility of war. And then I uh, present three possible scenarios of the future of North Korean crisis. And th finally, I will talk a little about Japanese strategy for settling uh, this North Korean crisis. First, I'd like to talk that uh, a possibility of war is much higher than before since the last nuclear explosion of North Korea in uh, two months before in September. And I think that many experts agree that the likelihood becomes much, much higher and larger than before. 
uh, because of the hardening of American stance on this issue, and also because of Chinese participation to increase the pressure upon North Korea on sanctions. So that's why when I attended a conference uh, uh, a week before in Tokyo, uh, Ambassador Research Armitage, uh, former Deputy uh, Secretary of State, mentioned that the likelihood of war is around 25%. And uh, several days before, when I visited Moscow to attend several conferences, I discussed this issue with Russian experts. As you know, uh, recently, uh, North Korean head of delegation on the Six Party Talk and uh, this kind of issue in Ministry of Foreign Affairs visited recently Moscow to discuss some issues with Russian experts and officials. And some of Russian experts there, when I talked with them, told me that the likelihood of war is much higher than 25%. And they told me that, many of them told me that, something like 50%. So uh, it would be maybe mean, uh, 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 meaningless to describe the, this kind of percentage. But uh, the, the, the only thing is that, the only thing that I we really want to focus on is that now the likelihood is much larger. That's why Japanese Defense Secretary Minister Onodera recently uh, uh, told, commented that uh, uh, from the end of this year onward to the next year, maybe Japan will face a serious crisis in North Korea. So we have to prepare for that. And Prime Minister Abe also said that because of this reason, he hold a snap election in December last month, rather than uh, to uh, fulfill his tenure until next year, September. So uh, the likelihood is much larger. And then I like to uh, uh, describe three scenarios, possible scenarios on the future of North Korean crisis. There are three possible scenarios according to my account. The first one is no war with uh, denuclearized North Korea. Of course, this is a goal of international community. This was decided by United Nations Security Council resolution, and also this was agreed by six-party talk, a joint declaration nearly a decade ago. But this scenario is extremely unlikely because as some of the previous speakers already mentioned in different panels, that the, the, the nuclearization strongly closely relates to the regime survival. So as long as North Korean regime likes to uh, survive, it is extremely unlikely to see the denuclearization of North Korea. The second scenario is no war with nu nuclearized North Korea. It means that North Korea maintains its nuclear weapons with ICBM or um, some other ballistic missiles. It is quite dangerous because North Korea continuously uh, try to intimidate United States as, long, uh, as well as Japan and South Korea or some other surrounding countries. So it is quite dangerous scenario because many, many smaller states would think that it would be safer or the most safest thing to have nuclear weapons to avoid American military strike. So it would be quite likely that we will see rapid proliferation spread of nuclear weapons to these smaller states. So the second scenario is quite undesirable. The third scenario is a war with nuclearized North Korea. It means that North Korea uh, is likely to uh, uh, attack Seoul or Tokyo, perhaps with nuclear warheads, uh, with its ballistic missiles. Of course, uh, North Korea uh, have a power to do that, and also North Korea has a clear will to destroy uh, Japan and uh, South Korea. Of course, it will be retaliated by huge amount of American military power, but uh, it is quite necessary for international community to denuclearize North Korea. So we have two quite undesirable scenarios. Uh, one is uh, uh, no war with nuclearized North Korea. It means a rapid spread of uh, nuclear weapons in international community. And the other one is, of course, a war. So maybe the situation is quite tense because uh, it's quite unlikely to dream of uh, another scenario such as no war with denuclearized North Korea. So finally, I'd like to conclude my talk by uh, describing Japanese strategy for solving this difficult issue. Of course, uh, Japanese strategy is to avoid war. 
But at the same time, Japanese strategy is try to uh, denuclearize North Korea. Can we uh, achieve these two goals simultaneously? Quite unlikely, but uh, still, we have to do that. And uh, well, maybe unlike the expectation of many people, perhaps, I would like to say that Japan has been, or Prime Minister Abe has been the leading player in this game for two reasons. Prime Minister Abe is very close. He is now playing a golf with President Trump. And it's really difficult for many officials in Washington, D.C., or establishments in Washington, D.C., to influence the policymaking process of President Trump. But uh, Prime Minister Abe has some influence upon the decision making of President Trump. That's why some officials and experts in the Washington, D.C. told me that the safest thing is to ask Prime Minister Abe to say something to Pre President Trump. So uh, he's Prime Minister Abe is quite influential. This is one thing. And he is experienced. In 2002, Prime Minister Abe visited Pyongyang to meet his the father of Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il. And since then, of course, in his first administration, he knew a lot, he knows a lot about the discussion in the Sixth Party talk. And that's why among the major a uh, leader of major countries. I think that Prime Minister Abe is most experienced and most familiar of the details of the developments of the North Korean missile problem, nuclear problem. That's why I think that Japan still uh, uh, can play a very important and influential role to try to solve the issue. And finally, I'd like to say that to solve this question of difficulty, I think the Japanese strategy is to consolidate international community to put a much stronger pressure. And the key is China. So I'm really looking forward to listening to my friend Professor Jia's comment on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your concise remarks. Now, in American baseball, a sport which I'm sure all of you are intimately familiar, uh, the manager usually puts the most powerful hitter in the number three spot in the lineup. So Dr. Ja, <laughs> you're at the plate. If you could keep it to eight minutes, I would appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Marcus. Uh, it's a great uh, honor to be uh, here to share with you some of my views. Uh, probably I'll talk a little bit, uh, uh, you know, uh, I'll expand a little bit larger the, the topic. I think uncertainty is probably the key word to capture the situation of Asian security. It is uncertain, uh, at least for three major reasons. One is that we seem to be witnessing an emerging rivalry or strategic rivalry between China and the US. Uh, Americans appear to be more and more concerned about the rise of Chinese military, especially the rise of Chinese naval uh, capabilities. Uh, there are a lot of predict people predicting that we will have more confrontation in the South China Sea over the construction and uh, on the features of the concern by the concerned parties and also their military activities on the constructed features. Okay. So we're talking about China, Vietnam, and Philippines, and these, people, uh, these countries may uh, continue to do certain things. And then we will see military uh, frictions and com confrontation. And also, uh, uh, the Trump administration appeared to, to uh, be ready to give a speech. Uh, on the so-called free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, so some people say this is American strategy to uh, forge some kind of alliance in uh, the region uh, against China. And of course, uh, there are a lot of Chinese are also very wary about what the US is going to do. So we have been talking about trying to avoid the so-called Lucidity's trap, okay. but it seems to me that we're moving in that direction, uh, if, we, if only that we are not there yet. Okay. Uh, 
It's also uncertain because uh, the territorial and maritime disputes remain very much alive okay, between China and India uh, among the you know, South China Sea uh, claimants and also between China and, and, and uh, Japan in the East China Sea. Uh, despite the fact that the situation there uh, has been uh, improving, uh, appear to be stabilizing. Uh, however, things can happen. Uh, frictions may rise again anytime uh, in the days to come because there are no formal agreements as to how to manage these problems so far. The situation is also uncertain because of the North Korean nuclear threat. Okay. Uh, North Korea government has resisted, resisted the international pressures, disregarded the international sanctions in its efforts to push for uh, its nuclear weapons program. Okay. This has prompted uh, President Trump's threat to take a preemptive strike. Okay. A lot of people are nervous. Uh, uh, we are too, uh, but uh, it seems to me that the chance for that to happen is increasing. Uh, even if that ha will not happen, uh, we still have a problem of the outbreak of a crisis in North Korea in a number of scenarios. One is a failed mil nuclear test okay. uh, may touch off a crisis in North Korea. Uh, you never know. You know. Some people say, you know, uh, given the backward facilities that North Korea have uh, in developing nuclear weapons, uh, a failure can happen uh, sooner or later. Okay. The second scenario is an earthquake induced by uh, the test uh, would touch off uh, or, or bring alive the volcano in the Changbai Mountain between China and, uh, and North Korea. Okay. That could have a disastrous effect both the, in terms of environment and also in terms of human lives. The third scenario is the UN initiated another sanctions induced crisis in North Korea. The sanctions are becoming tighter and tighter. Uh, sooner or later, uh, if North Korea, North Korea continues its nuclear program and missile programs, we will see a day that China would totally cut off oil supply to North Korea. This may bring some problems, uh, great problems in North Korea domestic politics. Uh, we don't know. And of course, uh, there is also another scenario that's factional struggle uh, within North Korea uh, uh, government and party. Uh, some people have expected this to happen a long time ago. So far, it hasn't happened. But that does not mean that it will not happen. Uh, you never know. Okay. And finally, U.S. preemptive strike may touch off a crisis in North Korea. So, so crisis situation. Uh, has become more likely because of the recent developments. The good news is uh, that first, you know, President Xi and President Trump seem to have gotten along uh, with each other uh, so far. Uh, uh, it's uh, quite impressive that these two strong characters uh, find each other uh, respectful. And they are, like, they are likely to work together to address the North Korea nuclear issue. So President Trump is going to visit Beijing. We'll see the result. The second good news is uh, that the relations between China and its neighbors, especially Japan and South Korea, are improving. Okay. Uh, so uh, this may uh, lessen the tension and uh, help to manage the disputed territories and maritime interests in the south, well, in the East China Sea. And finally, I think the shared interests and stakes between China and the US 
uh, are much larger than many uh, people realize. Okay. Many people have been saying that these two countries are getting at each other uh, very soon, uh, but I think they have too many and too much stake to worry about uh, to, to do that. Okay. Hence, despite uncertainty, Asia's security may not be doomed. Uh, I think uh, the best we can do is to hope for the best and prepare for the worst. Okay. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we are going to move from Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia. Uh, Dr. Jia gave us a nuclear-induced earthquake. Uh, Mr. Yao, I hope you don't have anything like that down in Malaysia. Thank you, Jack. Firstly, I must apologize that I need to leave immediately after I speak because I've got a 6.30 flight and I thought I could stay until the end of the session, but the transport people just say that I need to leave the hotel by 4 p.m. I like to very briefly say that in my opinion, there are six key security challenges facing Asia as a whole. Number one, we've heard the North Korea crisis. I think, as we all know, this is a crisis that is unknown, unpredictable, but my point is that we can't afford to have war or conflict as the cost of that is too high and could perhaps even lead to a World War III. We need to deal with two stubborn and unpredictable leaders and, and to be prepared for uncertainties. Few people would ever have thought that several months ago, the brother Kim Jong-un was assassinated in my airport in Kuala Lumpur, and, and that was something that was totally unpredictable. I, I'd like to perhaps say that there are three ways that we should deal with North Korea. Firstly, I think direct negotiations is important. That has to be an opening of direct links. The US Special Representative of North Korea, Ambassador Jo Yoon, happens to be a very close friend of mine because he was the US ambassador in Malaysia before taking up his new role. And he was telling me that he's not allowed to even visit North Korea. And how can we have a person who is supposed to be handling negotiations with North Korea not being able to visit North Korea? So I think we need to persuade the State Department to, to perhaps look at a more direct negotiation approach to North Korea. Secondly, I think there has to be stronger UN sanctions in North Korea and enforcement of those sanctions. Uh, in Malaysia, for example, we have frozen the bank account of the North Korean embassy. The North Korean embassy has been very active uh, promoting importing things and trade between uh, North Korea and using the embassy in Malaysia to do other uh, commercial activities. I think we need to close that down. And, and thirdly, I think we need to ensure, and that's somewhat controversial, ensure that there's no regime change in North Korea. We all don't like Kim Jong-un. But I think to pursue regime change, I think, is very dangerous, very unpredictable, and could lead to unwanted consequences. So that's North Korea. My second key security challenge that Asia needs to address, of course, is also something that was alluded to earlier, South China Sea. We need to find a way forward in the South China Sea approach, possibly bringing to a fruition the conclusion of a code of conduct between China and ASEAN. It may need a two-part solution. China prefers bilateral negotiations between China and specific countries, uh, which I think would possibly continue and go on. But I think China needs to also accept that it has to uphold multilateral and international norms like the law of the sea and freedom of navigation. And I think in this regard, many of us in ASEAN are hoping that at the China ASEAN summit in Manila next week, the COC could be signed. The third security challenge is in Myanmar, the Rohingya crisis. That, I think, is the biggest humanitarian crime facing Asia today. We are deeply disappointed with Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, many have held her up as a democracy icon, but now the ethnic and inhumane uh, cleansing in Rakhine State are worrying in the sense that it could spur a growth of terrorism. I think the world must pick out on this serious humanitarian crisis. Fourth challenge I think we need to deal with in Asia is the Pakistan-India-China border. 
minor skirmishes there, but it can lead to accidental flare-up. I would leave the governor to speak on this later, as that is his specific area of expertise. The fifth challenge I think we need to deal with is Islamic State terrorism and the potential of lone wolves attack in Southeast Asia. I think that is something that we are very worried about. Uh, that is not the biggest threat to Southeast Asia right now. The, the conflict in the city of Marawi in southern Philippines is an almost open urban war with volunteers coming from Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore fighting alongside Filipino Islamic terrorists. The radicalization of young Muslim youth fighting as volunteers in Syria and now coming back to our countries is indeed very worrying because these people could become lone wolves in, in carrying out terrorist activities. My sixth point, I think, which is important to also take into consideration are non-traditional security threats. And these could be things like transboundary crimes, drug and human trafficking, economic and cyber crimes, piracy, human rights abuses, and the uh, smuggling of children and women. The key questions that we face then are the existing confidence building mechanisms sufficient? What more can be done to further enhance regional peace and stability? For Southeast Asia right now, for many years, we've got the ASEAN Regional Forum, and more recently, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting. I think these will continue to be important mechanisms. The question now is, should Asia adopt the European OSCE as a model that perhaps can be a bigger region-wide security uh, mechanism? We need to also have more intelligence sharing among countries in Asia because that is so important in the fight against terrorism. There need to be also new mechanisms and protocols to combat cybersecurity and cyberterrorism. One key point that we have been advocating for a long time is that we need to have governments throughout the region pushing forward for more inclusive development. To reduce inequalities is important because often inequalities are the cause of terrorism and we need to reduce these causes of terrorism. And to be able to engage the younger generation, I think is very important. Many of them are attracted by the Islamic uh, fundamentalists and extremism. We need to be able to get out and have good exchanges with them. I think at the end of the day, we need to have perhaps more track two or track 1.2, um, 1 1.5 uh, dialogues, candid, open, semi-official dialogues that track 2 or track 1.5 can achieve better than the official government dialogues. At the end of the day, I'd like to quote Winston Churchill, it's better to jaw jaw than to war war. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, if North Korea wasn't enough, he's added the South China Sea, Myanmar, Pakistan, India, China, ISIS, and non-traditional security threats to the agenda. Uh, safe travels back to KL. <laughs> Yusuf Wanandi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Good fight. Well, I, I would like to expand a little bit because the three speakers have been concentrating on North Korea, and it's rightly so because this is the most maybe acute problem at this juncture. But at the same time, I consider that only as a symptom of the uncertainties of the region. And I do think, as in other regions we have talked about in the last two days, uncertainty is the new normal in East Asia as well. And now, why? What was, let me I'll try to explain some of the background. I, I think basically and mainly it is because of the rise of China, and especially now with President Xi Jinping, strong leadership. And then on the other hand is the election of President Trump, who has brought many uncertainties for us, as you know, because there is no that as far as I am concerned, in the last maybe one year or so, just also even before the elections, you know, we, we cannot follow what he really has in mind. That is maybe 
the most critical issue for me. If there is more certainties, then we know how to react. But with President Trump, we just don't know. And not only we don't know, he is also changing every day. What do you want to do with this man? You see, as a leader. So therefore, uh, there are sort of basic problems arising now, how we have to react, how we have to do next with the lacunas, with the gaps that has been established because of these uncertainties. Now, I do think that we should be positive and active. We cannot just leave it and walk away from it. And, and that's why I do think that meetings like this is a critical, important event that could at least create understanding and better understanding, if not, you know, of the issues and of the policies coming up in this relationship that I'm talking about. And secondly, also taking actions, taking cooperation, and as, as a filling of the possible gaps that has already been and has already started to be created. What do I mean by that? We definitely have to recognize the United States is an important country. And therefore, we cannot just leave her behind because she is too important to be left behind, basic. But of course, you know, we have to do all the efforts that is necessary to be done. But mind you, I have my doubts definitely, and it will be very great efforts on us. And even then, I still have my doubts. I don't know whether anything will be followed because he has a bunch of aides around him, especially the generals, who are trying to do just that on the security of East Asia particularly, to show you know, to him that the existing, actually, institutions and relationship that the United States has in the region is still very important and can just not be denied. And, 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 and because Trump losingly, of course, you know, besides the problem of jetting up the atmosphere on the North Korean problem and a uh, nuclear problem, which is not paying off, it makes everybody just a little bit more confused and excited. But furthermore, what, what, what has he brought in, in the new, uh, as new policies? But so that is definitely, you know, this is where we have to cooperate also because we have to stand up against this type of actually policies in the future and the uncertainties thereof. Now, secondly, I, I would like to argue is after we have to try it and definitely we have to try it out again and again and now uh, uh, President Trump is in the region and he is going to two ASEAN countries, one in Vietnam for APEC and the other one is for ASEAN East Asian Summit in Manila. Now, hopefully, this is one of these efforts I said where we have to persuade him and, and deal with him and try to convince him that all these policies that we have had are good. Now, but otherwise, you know, besides all these efforts, we also have to look possibilities of how to cooperate among ourselves. And if China shown, and that is the, the, the paradox, of course, you know, here we have uh, uh, actually a liberal, a liberal leader supposedly to be leading the world and the governance system of the world and compared to a, a more authoritarian rule and more, you know, uh, 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 actually illiberal man now open up to the problems that we are facing. It is Xi Jinping who said, I'm going to take the lead in opening up the trade arrangements, etc. I'm going to take the lead in the climate change problem. I'm going to take the lead also, you know, in changing and, and leadership of the world as, well, as such. So therefore, we also have to try out with China what she meant and what she is willing to do. We can just not leave that as an open question because I think cooperation is a very necessary thing. And therefore, even with China, we have to deal with China in the right way. Uh, open up, knows exactly what she is willing to do, and she has, of course, to show the seriousness of cooperation as she has done and tried to do in the South China Sea that has been mentioned by Michael. We have now concluded the framework for this COC, so-called the Code of Conduct, and we hope that next year or so 
we, we can uh, implement that in, in more concrete legal forms. So secondly, of course, we are also now trying to do this regional trading arrangement, the RCEP, so-called, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership in East Asia. And we try at least here also to do our part how to deal with this issue, which is so critical for the region because the region is so dependent on economic cooperation. Maybe let me stop at that because the, the moderator become, become serious, uh, uh, I think, uh, a little bit nervous now for the, for the time. So I, let me stop at that and, and, and open up, of course, for questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. We thought we had uh, Professor Hosoya until 4.30, but apparently we have him until right now. So um, thank you very much for your contribution. Have a safe travels back to Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> so now we turn to Mr. Uh, Narayan, who, uh, uh, who, is, who is the last, but uh, we know, of course, that means he is the first. So please. Sure. Yeah. Who is going to further expand our agenda as though it didn't need further expansion. <clears throat> Thank you, Marcus. <clears throat> it's a privilege to be here at the 10th World Policy Conference. And special thanks to Mantia Thiri for the stewardship of the WPC in these very fractured times. <clears throat> the last speaker has some advantages and some disadvantages. Much of what I would have liked to say has been covered. But I've been assured by Marcus that I can take in a couple of extra minutes if it comes to that. So from what we have just heard from the previous speakers, one thing is obvious, that the shift in the geopolitical center of gravity from the Euro-Atlantic to the Indo-Pacific, further overshadowed by the rise of China, has led to a very significant churn in relationships and events in Asia. Today, most of the rivalries in Asia are being played out in Northeast Asia, the Indo-Pacific, the so-called Afbak region, and West Asia. Asia may today be an area of economic growth, but the truth is that many of the old sources of stability in Asia have broken down. Earlier ideological divisions have weakened no doubt, but religious orthodoxy, radical Islamist ideology, and the terror imperative have become more marked. We've heard a lot just now about what's happening in North Korea, so I don't have to dilate on that at any point, excepting to say that all of us agree that North Korea poses one of the gravest threats seen to peace in the region and beyond. Than, at any, than any other one. We also heard a lot about what's happening in, in East Asia, and to some extent, Southeast Asia. I only want to say that most, most of us in Asia are concerned about where China stands. It's a great civilization. But there is an impression that China wishes to exert its authority, its, its insists on its exceptionalism and its uh, uniqueness. And most nations, particularly in East and Southeast Asia, are concerned as to where China is headed. The 19th Party Congress did little to assuage such concerns. And following China's announcement of its great power ambitions, its projection as a military and economic superpower, and especially the contents on President Xi's make China great again speech has added to these concerns. But I'm here basically to speak about South, troubles in South Asia and West Asia. South Asia, Afghanistan in South Asia is today one of the most troubled regions not only in Asia, but across the world. Afghanistan may be in South Asia, but I think it is the heart of Asia. 
the situation here is extremely fragile. The elected government in Afghanistan has lost control over much of the countryside, almost 40%, perhaps even more. None of the other groups that are present in Afghanistan can claim any control, any, any large size control over areas and territory. The most distinctive aspect of Afghanistan is the degree of violence that is present there. I don't think it's being reflected to the same extent as, as I think we should, as well, at least what people of us who live in South Asia and perhaps Southeast Asia are aware of. Today, the so-called Afghan Taliban, the Haqqani network, the ISIS, that is the Islamic State, apart from several other terrorist groups indig indigenous to Afghanistan, such as the hizb e islami and the Harkat-e-Islami, Harkat they are the defining aspect of Afghanistan. The elected government counts for much less than the actual degree of violence that is taking place. Almost on an, on a, on an average, a minimum of about 30 to 40 people are being killed in Afghanistan, and this does hardly finds much mention there. Achieving peace in Afghanistan is entirely dependent on getting the Afghan Taliban to the negotiating table. This can be achieved only through the exercise of force. Without the Afghan Taliban agreeing to accept some of the conditions for talks, no peace can exist. At the same time, you can't do that to the exclusive thing of, of only the Taliban because there is the ISIS specter or the Islamic State specter which has to be there. So we have a conflict of, of priorities as far as the region is concerned. I assure you that the situation is extremely complex and complicated. The occasional increase in troops, the lessening of troops, etc., has not added to the situation, uh, had not brought any more measure to the situation. There are efforts being made for peace in Afghanistan. There is a Pakistan led quadrilateral coordination group, which includes the United States and China, apart from Pakistan and Afghanistan but it is not making any headway. Only, last, only this month, I think, oh, no, sorry, last month, the, quad, uh, the quadrilateral meeting held, but two days after the meeting was held, there were two devastating attacks in Afghanistan. There is another one which is being organized by the Shanghai Co Cooperation Organization, the, the contact group, that is also meeting with the same unfortunate fate. Michael mentioned about two other critical areas of conflict in South Asia. One is, of course, the Pakistan-India imbroglio which is going on. I agree that there are tensions in between the two countries. The situation has, to some extent, deteriorated in the past two years. But I think there is a great deal of restraint on both sides, so I, and I would like to assure this House that the possibility of a major conflict or a co confrontation is not present. It is, it is present, it is an ever-present reality, but I think the leadership on both sides is aware of the nature of the threat and the seriousness of the threat. There was a reference Michael also made to the China-India conflict. I was the special representative for border talks with China during the years as national security advisor. We have differences. We have a very long border. There are difficulties across the border. But I can assure you that a conflict, an open conflict, other than border incursions and border kinds, is out of the question. We recently had a standoff at a place called Doklam. It is, it is in Bhutan, on the tri-junction between Bhutan, India, and China. And I, sh I can assure this house that both India and China are conscious of the complications that can arise if they go beyond certain states. There will be tensions, but the tensions can, will be maintained. So I think China-India border problem is not something that we need to be concerned as a long term. That this is a clash between two civilizations, and I think that will continue. I do think there was, there was no mention here about West Asia, and I think that is a, an area which requires a great deal of attention because four of the, of the countries in the world which have the largest Muslim populations are in Asia. Indonesia, 
Bangladesh, Pakistan, India. So what happens in West Asia, particularly not so much maybe the, the clashes as much as the ideological clash that is taking place between Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shiite Iran, creating the possibility of a basic divide down the middle is, has potential for, for countries which have large Muslim populations. The Shia Sunni balance is something that I think we need to. We are in Morocco here. We are on the, on the periphery of the region. It is something that is going to be going to remain with us for some time. It has implications which are not too obvious at this moment. It is not going to be confined to Saudi Arabia. I'm sorry, to West Asia. It is going to be much beyond that. The Qatar standoff with Saudi Arabia is an instance in point of this kind. There is also another aspect. The ISIS facing, is facing some setbacks in, in areas like Syria and, and Iraq and whatnot. But do remember that as the ISIS is so-called suppressed in this region, their, their stormtroopers are moving across the rest of the world. We need to be aware that this will, Michael touched on this point, that terrorism will be magnified as a result of an excessive pressure that has been applied here. There is also the aspect that as ISIS weakens, other forces are emerging in this area. The Kurds, for instance, are trying to redraw the boundaries of some of the countries. I do believe that the next phase of the struggle in West Asia <clears throat> may be determined by, the, by who controls the territory once held by the ISIS. But do remember that notwithstanding whatever is happening in terms of the conflict between countries, etc., the ideology and appeal of radicalized Islamist movements, especially the ISIS and Al-Qaeda, remains unaffected. One word of caution. If the Iran nuclear deal were to unravel, I think we'll have a new area of tensions arising in the region. The implications of this, I think, I wish we could have a special session on that. What I would like to stress is that Asian security today, one of the speakers said that things are better. My assessment is that Asian security today is in a state of flux. There are major centers of violence that have emerged. There's West Asia, which I briefly touched on. There is Afghanistan, which I dealt with in a little more detail. There are problems across in parts of Southeast Asia where nations are concerned about the rise of China's ambitions. And of course, there are the conflicts in East Asia itself, the South China Sea, East China Sea. Simon. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now I'd like to uh, turn to the question and answer period. What I'd like to do is group, say, three questions together and then give the panel the opportunity to respond. When you ask a question, please identify yourself. And if the question's uh, directed at a particular individual, uh, please let us know that as well. Doug Paul. Thank you. I'm Doug Paul from the Carnegie Endowment in Washington. Um, I want to thank the organizers for arranging the conference version of the Farewell Symphony of Haydn, where one by one the performers leave before the piece is over. <laughs> um, I, I want to first pay tribute to uh, Governor Narayanan's uh, insight and wisdom on the big picture of security in China. In the great tradition of Indian diplomats like Sham Saran and and uh, Shiv Shankar Menon, and now VJ Gokhale in Beijing. That's a, a very important statement. But I want to ask two somewhat related questions. Throughout the discussion of North Korea, no one has mentioned containment or deter deterrence. Um, some have talked about comprehensive, uh, verifiable, irreversible destruction of the nuclear capabilities, but that seems to be very far away and people don't want to intrude with violence. Uh, so we may be living with containment and deterrence a long time. 
Can we do that for 35 years or whatever the life expectancy of Kim Jong-un is likely to be? And secondly, and a little bit more provocatively, if you go to the White House and ask people in the current administration about the erratic statements of President Trump and his kind of saber-rattling characterizations in 144 characters, um, they'll say, have you noticed that he has intimidated China into taking more steps to constrain the flow of assistance to North Korea? Have you noticed that since he made his threats, there have been no more ICBM tests or nuclear tests? Uh, maybe his methods have a way of working. How do you respond to that? Very good, yes. Uh, I'm uh, Renaud Girard, I'm the um, Foreign Affairs uh, columnist of Le Figaro, which is a French daily. Um, I would like to, I mean, the main danger in Asia is two rising powers, China and America. Um, I would like to know, because the situation in the current peninsula will not change, I mean, uh, China obviously doesn't want uh, reunification of uh, Korea. Even in South Korea, I don't think that the youth wants to uh, a reunification with North Korea, maybe the old people, but not the youth. Uh, Japan, I think, doesn't say anything about that, but I don't think that Japan wants the reunification of, uh, of Korea, so I don't think that the, the, there will be any change and you have a, a dictator who doesn't want to end like Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein and tries to protect himself. Um, but the, um, but there's these two big rising powers, but the rising power uh, which is China and the last power is America. Uh, I would like to know what is exactly the role that China assigns to the U.S. in Pacific. What are they ready, what China is ready to accept as an American presence in the Pacific, in Asia? That's the question of a man who asks questions for a living. Um, any other questions before I turn to the panel? Okay, so who would like to go first? Sure, Yusuf. Well, the first is Doc's uh, uh, question. I think the containment and deterrence I would like to leave to the, the experts of, of the North, uh, of the Korean Peninsula. But uh, what shall I say to the question when somebody asks, he has achieved a lot with all this bull, uh, BS, sorry, uh, you know? And, and, and so, what, what do you, so how do you respond to that? Well, my response is, that is also a question mark, whether he has achieved it because of his rhetorics. For me, it's a question mark, because this King Jong-un is not a dummy too. You know? And therefore, I don't think it is now you know, a, a, a relevant to ask, to ask the question whether this rhetorics that confuses things a lot in the meantime is really critical for the containment and deterrence that you mentioned, maybe. Well, I don't believe that, to be frank with you. Number two, but that it, of course, Chan Chi-Guo will be uh, uh, answering it as, 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 as a scholar, um, um, of a Chinese scholar. But what I have picked up, you know, on, on the, the road, that road that China would like to give to the United States is, that East Asia is big enough for both of them to cooperate and to survive. They don't want some of the things, and you know which one, such as spying along their coast, and et cetera. They don't like that, and they are opposed to that. And they are, of course, in the long term, preparing themselves for the eventuality, according to me, that there will be a confrontation with the United States one day. But for the time being, first they know that they are not ready completely to take over. Second, also they know that you know, they are still 
a lot to be done that they can do together. That is my observation from the outside on what China thinks at this stage, for the next 10 years at least, you know, on the role of the United States. Jingho, maybe you can add because you know better. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the first question is uh, whether deterrence and containment strategy uh, can be used. Uh, well, I think from the American perspective, it can be used. Actually, you can erect a missile defense system in the middle of the Pacific and protect yourself. Uh, but the problem is, uh, even from the American perspective, it can pose a serious problem. Uh, first, what about the eastern part of, uh, I mean, the, the Pacific part of the uh, US? Uh, it cannot be protected uh, by some kind of a missile defense arrangement. And also, what about the military alliances you have? Uh, American uh, allies, Japan and South Korea especially, are not going to be happy with that because they don't have a viable deterrence uh, capability to, 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 to do that. And China is not happy <laughs> because China has, is next to uh, South Korea. <laughs> no uh, deterrence, uh, I mean, no um, defense, uh, uh, missile defense arrangement can, can protect China. And also, there is a more serious problem that is uh, proliferation uh, regime is going to be down the drain. Okay. Oh, non-proliferation regime is going to be down the drain. Okay. So um, it's a it's a problem, a uh, uh, big challenge uh, for all of us. Uh, uh, Trump's policy uh, on North Korea or on. China to make China to push for push North Korea is that working? Uh, to some extent, it's working, uh, but at the same time, I think uh, it works because China is China's position is moving in that direction. Okay. I remember. Well, I, I think China's the discourse on North Korea in China uh, policy uh, discourse has moved over time from how much we should help North Korea to whether we should help North Korea, to uh, how much we should push North Korea uh, nowadays. Okay. So you know, given this contest, uh, it's not a surprise that uh, she is more uh, you know, uh, res responsive to uh, Trump's pressures. And finally, uh, reunification of, uh, I mean, what's the role of the U.S. Uh, in the Pacific, in the Asia, in this region for China, uh, what's the ideal role? <laughs> I don't know what what's the uh, what the ideal role is, but uh, I think China on the rise uh, poses a serious problem for China as well. Uh, that is, it's very difficult to define its interests, to know what it really wants. Okay. China is both a developing country and a developed country at the same time. It's a rich country and poor country at the same time. It's a strong country and weak country at the same time. It's an ordinary country and a superpower at the same time. And its interests are in conflict. Uh, so it's very difficult for China to figure out what it wants uh, at, this good, at this moment uh, of transition. So uh, that, to some extent, uh, affect our view of what the proper role of the U.S. in, the Pacific, in, the, in this part of the world. Uh, sometimes we want the U.S. to stay and to play a larger role, uh, especially when it comes to make sure that uh, Japan will not become remilitarized, and also to maintain the security order in the region. Uh, but sometimes we find the, the U.S. presence uh, a nuisance. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. military uh, try to stop China from doing this and doing that, and threaten to, to uh, uh, you know, issue threats against China. Um, so 
uh, I don't know, you know, China also finds itself exclu excluded from the, these uh, military alliances. So it's like it's the other party, uh, not one of us. So uh, I think this creates, uh, this, this alienates China. So uh, I think uh, the, it will take some time for China to, to develop a, 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 a more uh, clear uh, uh, you know, view as to what kind of role uh, uh, is proper for the US to play in the region. Let me stop here. Well, uh, yeah, I think uh, officers, uh, you know, retreated and uh, poor soldiers standing in the front, I mean, you know, for the barrage of <laughs> uh, difficult questions. But nevertheless, well, uh, I like uh, Doug Powell uh, for the question. Uh, out of his uh, maybe uh, disappointment, I mean, in dealing with North Korea, uh, well, we, we put our hands on this issue when we were in Washington together. So, uh, well, Doug has been very much disappointed, tired uh, of North Korea's brinkmanship. Well, so I'm glad he uh, raised this question and uh, put up his uh, wisdom uh, to deal with North Korea. Uh, you know, by the means of containment and deterrence. Well, I spent, uh, you know, most of my uh, diplomatic career uh, struggling with this issue, and uh, uh, I got retired without seeing the result, uh, resolution of this issue, but my mind is always on this issue. Uh, well, when I uh, dealt with North Korea, uh, I thought we could realize some bargaining, um, and uh, even we could buy a North Korean nuclear program uh, with the cash. And, uh, but I think I was mistaken, and uh, I don't think anymore uh, we can uh, deal with North Korean nuclear program with providing uh, economic uh, assistance or cash. Well, um, so uh, if we try to resolve this issue in a short period of time, then uh, we are, you know, we tend to make uh, similar mistakes. So I think we have to have enough time uh, to to do something. I mean, for uh, this issue, so um, you know, containment and the strengthen the sanctions. Uh, by the UN, by the international community, is the right track. So they feel pains. I mean, you know, uh, well, uh, the past sanctions or, you know, UN uh, statement was uh, peanut. I mean, it didn't work. So North Korea thought very lightly of any actions taken by the UN at that time. But now different. I mean, this issue was among the countries concerned in the region, now it has become the global security issue. So I'm glad that uh, we take up this issue in this uh, World Policy Conference. Uh, so it will take you know, longer time. And uh, I think a containment plus deterrence, military deterrence, extended deterrence provided by the US, I think will take effect. Well, uh, about China's role toward North Korea, well, uh, Professor Jia, you know, uh, he explained, I mean, uh, the attitude changed, I mean, uh, you know, from, uh, well, uh, the past, I mean, uh, uh, Chinese always thought how to help North Korea, you know, overcoming these difficulties, issues, but now uh, they think whether they should do that or not. But I have some different opinion, you know. Well, uh, we, as you know, uh, we introduced the third system to defend uh, the uh, US military, I mean, stationed in Korea. And uh, we thought it was necessary to defend uh, ourselves as well as uh, the US forces. But because of that, I mean, China punished the South Korea and they severed all 
uh, you know, normal and regular relations for about one year. During the time, Korean business, I mean, you know, inflicted a lot of loss. I mean, uh, uh, even Lotte Business Group, they closed down their retail uh, sector uh, operating in, in China. And the Hyundai cars, their sales cut back half. So, I mean, uh, the amount of uh, Korean businesses loss amounted to maybe billions of dollars. So, well, I'm glad that uh, recently uh, we, we, you know, uh, China and Korea uh, made agreement, I mean, to, to finish uh, this awkward, I mean, situation. So, uh, we will return to the normal uh, good relations. So, uh, it, well, why China punished South Korea instead of North Korea when we took our self-defense measure. So that is my question mark, but uh, I will stop here. Could I use my moderator's prerogative to ask you a question on an entirely different topic, because we're about to run out of time? No, I just, I just wanted to explain okay, a point. Well, then it's over. Because everybody talks about North Korea, but I thought the, the, the China in Asia is a bigger issue than, than North Korea. And I think it, it, has, it, it has implications for the world at large. I mean, I think from, from the rest of Asia, the view is that China is the rising power today. And China is not masking its ambitions. The other transformative reality is that the United States is seen as a status quo power. I don't, I don't want to use the word receding power. It has implications across the region. Take India, for instance. We, we, we have no basic conflict, in the, but there is, a, there is an, a, a, what I call a civilization conflict between these two nations. We have now developed much closer relations with Japan, and, and I think one reason is the rise of China kind of thing. It's not that we anticipate that China is going to attack anyone, but then impression. Now, the United States, the pivot to Asia is completely gone. So all nations are adjusting their priorities. I think the rise of China is the most dominant aspect of politics, at least as far as Asia is concerned. I'm not saying that China is going out of its way to prove it, but, but it is a fact. And therefore, there was for a long, the United States had pressed for a quadrilateral between the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. India had been, really. India is now shifting stance to some extent. It has softened its approach towards this. It's all a part of the thing. So the rise of China, the, and I don't know when to use the word weakness of the United States is having a very major uh, sort of impact on the way nations are adjusting their priorities and their situations. And I think how this term, uh, plays out is going to be what is the future for the next five years in, kind of, between the 19th and the 20th party Congress. And President Xi certainly gives an impression that he's not merely in command of China, but he wishes to be in command of a lot greater, greater area. So I think we have to be careful. And I, I'm taking it not merely looking at the North Korean angle, I'm looking at the entire point, whether it's Southeast Asia, East Asia, et cetera. And China has now moved. It's now, it's a major factor in West Asia also. China and Russia have become major, major factors in the West Asian situation. So all this makes China a rising power. I don't say necessarily it's a, it's a wrong, wrong thing, but it is a factor. And it has an impact on almost all nations, certainly even a country like India. OK, well, thank you very much. I think that wraps up this panel. Thank you to our participants. Look forward to the Young Leaders panel coming up next.